Good morning, and welcome to Divine Savior Church, where we're all about changing lives with Jesus as we worship, connect, and serve. I'm Pastor Stephen Apt, and I'm glad that you're here today. If there's any way that we can connect with you or anything I can pray for you about, please let me know. I'd be happy to get you any information you need and happy to pray uh, for you about anything that's on your mind, no matter how big or how small. So please reach out and uh, happy to do that. Today we continue our sermon series called There's Another in the Fire. And we come to Daniel chapter 6. And, and this whole series has really been about how we are foreigners here on earth. As Christians, our home is in heaven. Here on earth we're living as foreigners and we're not alone. There's another one here with us. And that's what we see again today in Daniel chapter 6. There's another in the fire with us when we face persecution. And so we're going to see that throughout the entire theme today. Uh, we're going to see it in our scripture readings and our message this morning. We're going to see it in our songs. And it's going to be our focus. God bless your worship as we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are a rescuing God, a saving God, and that is what you have done for us as you have rescued us from sin and from death and from the devil. Uh, as we gather around your word this morning, we ask that you magnify that characteristic of you, that we grow in just how big of a Savior you are. And the more we grow in that, the more we'll be able to stand firm uh, when persecution comes our way. Strengthen our faith today through your word. Send your Holy Spirit uh, into our hearts to strengthen us. In your name we pray. Amen. We begin this morning by singing our opening song, Holy God, we praise your name.
As we come to worship God this morning, let's do so by confessing our sins. God is holy and perfect. We have sinned and fallen short of his glory. And so let's take a moment to confess all of that guilt, all of that weight, all of that sin, and let's put it on to Jesus. Uh, and then let's be reminded how he went to the cross for us. And so what we're going to do here is I'm going to give you uh, about 10 seconds to confess the sins that are weighing on your heart this morning. And then we'll hear from God and his word. We confess. The good news found in the Bible is that God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy on us. And he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to be our perfect substitute. Jesus lived the perfect life God wanted us to. He died on the cross for our sins and he rose victoriously from the grave. Because of Jesus, God announces to you today that all of your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace that you sent your one and only Son to live and die for us and rise again from the dead. We thank you that through him our sins have been forgiven. And we ask that now you send your Holy Spirit into our heart to uh, grow us in that message so that our hearts have peace. We no longer are responsible for our guilt and shame. Jesus has taken it from us and has uh, paid the price for our sin, and we cannot be more thankful. Fill us with the peace that comes knowing that our sins are forgiven. Amen. As we continue in this series, where we've been walking through Daniel, and we've been walking through 1 Peter for our scripture lesson. Daniel takes place around 600 B.C. Peter writes his letter uh, around 60 A.D. And Peter's writing to Christians scattered throughout uh, what was known as Asia Minor. Today it's modern day Turkey. And he's writing to them and he calls them foreigners and exiles because he knows their home is in heaven and we live here on earth as foreigners. And in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter instructs us on how to live in this world. Here's what he says Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as a supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it's God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. This is God's word. As we live here as Christians on earth, uh, we do so, Peter says, as God's slaves. God is our number one. His business is our business. What he says, we submit to, and we live that way. And, and Peter says, God doesn't want us to use our freedom for evil, but instead do good. And as we do good and as we live our Christian lives, even those who want to accuse us of doing wrong won't be able to. Instead, they will see our lives and hopefully we pray that they end up praising our God through us. Our uh, gospel lesson today, our second lesson, comes from John chapter 17. Here Jesus is praying on the night before he dies. Uh, we call this section the high priestly prayer. Jesus is praying for his disciples, and actually, at one point, he prays for you and me as well, all those who believe the message through that the disciples were going to preach. But here's what he says in John chapter 17. Jesus prays, I'm coming to you now, talking to God, but I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, 
but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. This is the gospel of our Lord. Did you catch what Jesus said twice? They are not of the world any more than I am of the world. Jesus recognizes and and announces that Christians are not of this world. We belong in heaven. And one day we will be there. But as we live here, the evil one is is around. And Jesus' prayer is that God doesn't take us out of the world, but his prayer is that he protects us from the evil one. Because the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour, you and me. And as Christians living far in a faraway land from heaven, the devil will target us and he will come after us. And Jesus is praying, not just then, but even now in heaven, that God our Father protects us. And he does, because our God is a God who rescues and saves. All right, children, gather around. I've got a children's devotion. All right, I've got two shirts here. The first shirt is a Texas A&M shirt, an Aggie shirt. They're over in College Station, about an hour and a half from here. The other shirt I have is a Texas Longhorn shirt. And if you know anything about UT and A&M, they are rivals. If you were to wear your A&M shirt on the Longhorn campus, uh, you would probably get some mean things said to you. But the same is true as if, if you wear your Longhorn shirt on the A&M campus, you'd probably have some mean things said to you. And as you walk through the campus with those shirts on, and people are saying those mean things, you might be tempted to take the shirt off to get away from people aiming and saying mean things to you. But that's what happens when when two teams are rivals. They're all in on their team, and when it comes to their rival, they are out. They want nothing to do with them, and they don't want you to have anything to do with them either. In a way, that's what it's like to be a Christian. We are on Team God, and the devil has his own team. And when we are on team God and we walk around as a Christian and we live like a Christian, the devil is going to inspire and influence people to say mean things to us. That's called persecution. It's when people say mean things to Christians, that's hard to take. And we'll be tempted to want to take off our team shirt, so to speak. And we'll want to hide our Christianity. But we don't have to. Because Team Devil is not as strong as Team God. Because Team God has Jesus. And Jesus is a God who rescues and he saves. And that's what he's done for you and me. He's rescued and saved us from the devil, from the, wor- or from the world, from death, and from sin. God rescues and saves us and he will continue to do just that. And so we can trust him to continue to rescue and save us in all circumstances. Let's pray asking him to strengthen our faith so that when those times come, we stand firm. Dear Jesus, we thank you for bringing us onto your team. We thank you that you have defeated the devil, uh, the sin, and death. We thank you that you are a God who rescues and saves, and we ask you to strengthen our faith uh, so that we know more and more, and we trust more and more, that you will rescue and save us no matter what. In your name we pray. Amen. We'll continue with the sermon. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. For even though you walk through the darkest valley and in the shadow of death, Fear no evil, for I am with you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, for the Lord your God goes with you. For if you belong to the world, 
it would have loved you as its own. But as it is, you do not belong to the world. For this time, I have told you these things, so that in me, you may have peace. For in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I grew up in the Chicagoland area, and growing up, uh, I had the opportunity of going to many Chicago Cubs games at Wrigley Field. And I'll never forget one of the games. Uh, it was a night game. I was sitting down the left field line off the field. Uh, they were playing the San Francisco Giants. When all of a sudden, in my section, I started hearing all of these people booing. And, and looking out at the field, there was nothing going on that really deserved people booing, so uh, I was looking around and I see this guy walking through the stands wearing a Chicago White Sox jersey. Obviously the Cubs rival. And I could not believe the audacity of this guy because the Cubs weren't even playing the White Sox and here this guy is wearing his White Sox jersey to a Chicago Cubs game. Was that guy walked through the stands, he got in the crosshairs of many Cubs fans. And next thing you know it, people started throwing all kinds of things at him. People threw a bag of popcorn. People threw their hot dogs. People threw beer at him. And all of that was surprising, but the thing that stood out to me the most was how this guy reacted. He knew he was in the crosshairs, but he was so all in on his team that he wasn't going to take off his jersey. He didn't cower in fear. He didn't cry. Instead, he walked confidently and almost encouraged the fans to throw things at him because that's how all in he was. He wasn't taking off his jersey no matter what. He was all in. As Christians living away from our home in heaven, sometimes we feel like that guy. Sometimes we feel like we are in the crosshairs and people are taking aim at us. And it's true. We are. And the question is, how do we respond in those moments? It's what we're looking at today as we continue in our series, Another in the Fire. And, and we're looking at the book of Daniel to see how these people reacted living in a foreign world. Uh, just to recap where we've been. The beginning of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar and the king of Babylon comes over to Jerusalem from the east takes over Jerusalem <clears throat> and takes Daniel and three of his friends over to Babylon. And so these Jews were, are now living in a foreign kingdom. And the, the rest of Daniel covers 50 to 70 years. And in that time period, King Nebuchadnezzar has died. In fact, the, the Babylonian Empire has fallen. And now in Daniel chapter 6, the Medes and the Persians are ruling and King Darius is on the throne. And Daniel, at 80 years old, finds his way into the administration. And we're going to see that as he's in that administration, he gets persecuted. He gets in the crosshairs. Here's what we're told. Daniel chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set over him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel and his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, We will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. All right, so Darius had a different way of ruling than Nebuchadnezzar. In Darius's kingdom, it was him on top, and then he had three administrators 
that oversaw 120 satraps. This was his governing style. Daniel so distinguished himself that he was one of the three administrators. But he was so great that Darius said, you know what, I'm just going to put Daniel in charge of everything. Then the king could just relax. Daniel in charge of the administrators who were in charge of the satraps, life would be good. But what happens when a company has a promotion up for grabs and they're, they're, they're going for th between three candidates in a company? Drama, right? Same is true here. The other people didn't like Daniel, and so what do they do? They start to dig up dirt on him, or at least trying to. If it happened today, what would they be digging into? His social media. He, they, pe people would be looking through his tweets. They'd be looking through his Facebook posts, through his Instagram posts, looking for some kind of incriminating evidence to show to the king, Daniel is not worthy of this position. The only problem? The more they dug, the more they realized there's nothing against this guy. He's not corrupt. He's exceptional in everything he does. He's not negligent. We've got nothing on him. And so then they decide there's only one way we're going to get Daniel. It's by attacking his relationship with his God. They put him in the crosshairs. And so here's what they do. So these administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now your majesty issued the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been pu published, he went to his home in his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. So the plan was simple for these guys. They approached the king and said, King, here's what we think would be good. Issue a decree that for 30 days you cannot pray to anyone or anything except to you. No other God can be prayed to. No other God can be worshipped for 30 days. And if they do, throw them into the lion's den. Oh, and by the way, King, make it by the law of the Medes and Persians. That's an important point. Because uh, in this time, the, the ancient Near East viewed the kings as an extension to the gods. Some even viewed them as God themselves. Pharaoh in Egypt, he was viewed as a god. And putting the law down according to the Medes and Persians was like saying that this is from the gods. And so if Darius were to change his mind, it would call into question his extension and his connection to the gods. Darius, puffed up by his pride and ego, thinks this is a great idea. Who wouldn't want everyone praying to him? And so he puts it into the law. Daniel hears it. And what's he do? He does what he normally does, what his custom is, which is go home, open up the window towards Jerusalem, and pray. Why was this his custom? Well, for sure he would rather be at home in Jerusalem, going to the temple to worship God, but he couldn't do that. Ever since he was a teenager, he's been living in Babylon, away from the temple of God. And so I wonder if this was in Daniel's mind the entire time. I wonder if King Solomon's words from the dedication of the temple in Jerusalem around 980 B.C., uh, I wonder if these words were stuck in his head. Here's what King Solomon prayed at the temple. When your people go to war against their enemies, wherever you send them, and when they pray to the Lord toward the city you have chosen and the temple I have built for your name, then hear from heaven their prayer and their plea and uphold their cause. I wonder if Daniel is thinking of these words and, 
And so every day since he was a teenager, he reorient, reoriented his worship practices to face the temple three times a day to pray and worship God. And these administrators knew this was Daniel's custom. And so Daniel continued to do it, even after this law was decreed. But why didn't Daniel just close the window? Uh, the threat of the lion's den... You could still worship God, just close the window and do it in, in private. Well, what impression would he be giving to these administrators if he did that? He'd be saying that, that God was not his all. That, that his life was more important than worshiping God. And Daniel said, no, 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 I'm all in on God. God is number one in my life and I'm not going to let anybody who puts me in the crosshair and takes aim at me change that. You see, Daniel was very much like that, that White Sox fan. He didn't care who was throwing or what was aimed at him. He was all in on God. And he wasn't going to take off his God jersey, so to speak. He wasn't going to close the window. He was all in. And nothing would change that. And so the question is, are you? Am I? Only you can answer for you and only I can answer for myself. But are we all in like Daniel? Are we comfortable being in the crosshairs as people take aim at us? Because make no mistake, as Christians living in this world, away from our home in heaven... The devil will take aim at us. There's nothing that the devil hates more than Christians being close to God. And so he's going to inspire and influence people around us to take aim at us. To pressure us. To make us choose between being all in on God and saving ourselves. He's going to make people pressure us to change our worship Practices to change what we're accustomed to when we are worshiping. He's going to pressure them to make us choose between worshiping God and doing something else. He's going to pressure people, or he's going to influence people to pressure us to either live for God or to have fun by sinning. He's going to take aim at us as people throw. Uh, confused and weird looks at us and, and make us feel like we're some big weirdos for not going along with the rest of the world. And in those moments, we're going to have to decide, are we all in? Are we going to keep God, number one, are we comfortable being in the crosshairs? Or are we going to take off the jersey and close up the windows, so to speak? Daniel was all in. He was all in despite being threatened with the lion's den. We don't get threatened with the lion's den. And yet how often aren't we willing to close up the window, so to speak, and we say, you know what, I'm going to worship in private and I'm not going to choose God over other things. Daniel was all in despite the lion's den. And that's exactly what happens. Here's what we're told. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the, the, the decree that you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to the king, 
to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. These guys knew that this was Daniel's custom, and so as soon as the law gets put into, into decree, as soon as the law gets put into uh, law and order, where do they go? Right outside Daniel's window. And they look up and they catch him in the act. And they immediately go and they tattle on him. And then they the king realizes he was deceived. These guys remind the king, you can't change this king. You have to throw him into the lion's den. And despite the king trying to save him, there was nothing he could do. And he orders Daniel to be thrown into the, to the lion's den. And that's what happens. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of the nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve, continually been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty." The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions, so Daniel, so Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. Daniel was in the den of the lions. And when he found, was found in the morning, there was no wound on him. Why? Daniel says, God sent his messenger and closed the mouths of the lions. Why would God do this? This is very important. It's not because Daniel was worthy of it. It was not because Daniel had such great faith that God was forced to reward him by saving him. No. Instead, King Darius tells us, God rescues and he saves. This is God's characteristics. God rescues and saves. That's the God that we have. He rescues and he saves, and he proves that he rescued and saved Daniel. This is a characteristic of God. And Daniel knew this about God. He trusted that God would rescue, rescue and save him. And so he, was, he could stand firm and be all in on God. He knew this is who God is. And so he trusted that God would rescue and save him. One way or another. Either he'd rescue him for the lions, or he'd rescue him and bring him home to heaven. He was all in. As we close up Daniel chapter 6, this is a part of the book that uh, ends the narrative section of Daniel. The rest of the book is prophetic. Uh, so the stories end here. And as we close up this section, uh, it can tend to lead us to feeling despair, inadequate. Because we look at these guys, Daniel and his friends, and we say, our faith is not even close to these guys. 
As soon as we get into the crosshairs, as soon as people take aim at us, we are willing to, to close up the window. We're willing to take off our God jersey, so to speak, in order to not have persecution come to us. We rearrange our life so that God isn't our number one. And these guys are willing to go to the lion's den so that God remains number one in their life. And yet, here's what I hope. Here's what I pray. I I pray that as we see Daniel and we see his great faith, I pray we see somebody else in this chapter. And that's Jesus. Did you notice all the similarities between Daniel's life and Daniel chapter 6 and Jesus' life? Just like Daniel was all in, Jesus was all in. And just like Daniel lived in the crosshairs, Jesus lived in the crosshairs his entire life. From the very moment he was born, people were trying to kill him. People took aim at him. As Jesus grew up, his peers looked for incriminating evidence against him, and yet there was none. Jesus was perfect. He was blameless. He he literally had no blemish on his record. Just like Daniel, Jesus was brought before the governing authorities. And what did it have to do with? His relationship with God. Blasphemy, they accused Jesus of. Just like Daniel, Jesus was thrown into a den. Daniel into a lion's den, Jesus into the den of hell, where the devil prowls around like a roaring lion. Unlike Daniel, Jesus actually died on the cross. Jesus died, Daniel remained alive, but Jesus died. But just like Daniel, Jesus also came out of the den of his tomb, and he was alive. Jesus came, and he was all in, and he lived in the crosshairs to the point where he actually was killed. Why would he do this? You. This is how all in he is on you. Why would Jesus come and live in the crosshairs? Why would he uh, take the abuse? Why would he have false accusations against him? Why would he be killed, buried, thrown into the den of Satan's lions? All for you. Because he rescues and he saves. And that's what he's done through that for you. He's rescued and saved you, not just from a lion's den, but Paul tells us in the book of Colossians, He saved us from the dominion of darkness. He rescued us from the dominion of darkness. God rescues and saves you from hell, from the den of hell. And he's done it through Jesus. And Jesus did it by entering into that den of Satan and conquering him through his death and resurrection. Jesus is all in on you. He was when he was here on earth and died and rose again, and he still is. He is a God who rescues and saves. It's important to know this for people like you and me who who struggle to be all in on God and all in on, on Jesus, because as we struggle, Jesus doesn't. We struggle to be all in, Jesus doesn't. He continues to rescue and save us. And as we want to be all in, the way we do that and the way we grow bold and have the courage to do that is to magnify his rescuing and saving power. And the more we grow in Jesus' rescuing and saving power, the more our faith grows and it emboldens us to stand firm even when we're in the crosshairs. You see, the more that we emphasize Jesus' rescue and saving uh, abilities, then the more our faith grows so that we can be like that White Sox fan, having no care in the world what's thrown at us, having no care that we're in the crosshairs. We could actually go into the den of the lions and know nothing's going to hurt us because our God has rescued and saved us from the dominion of darkness, from the real true enemy, the devil in hell. Our God rescues and saves us.
That's what he's done. That's what he will always do. And he, he's done it through Jesus. And so let's this week, instead of focusing on what we have to do, let's magnify what God has done for us. Through Jesus, he has rescued and saved us. And the more we put that in the spotlight, the more our faith will be emboldened to be just like Daniel. And we can stand firm in the crosshairs. Let's pray asking for God's strength. And we'll close our prayers with the Lord's Prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you that you have rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son you love. We thank you that you have rescued us from the devil, from the world, from death, from sin, from all kinds of persecution. But most importantly, you've rescued us uh, from the den of hell and our sin. We thank you for forgiveness. We thank you for your love. We ask you to help us magnify that this week. Help us to magnify what Jesus has done and his rescuing abilities so that our faith may be strengthened and we may stand firm in the crosshairs. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit into our heart. Fill us with his love, with faith, and with all the fruits of the Spirit so we may stand firm on the day that persecution comes. We ask you to be with all of our nation, all the people of our nation, all of the doctors, everyone who is experiencing COVID. We ask you to be with them. Uh, grant your healing and calm our fears. As we live in this world, uh, help us to be confident. Uh, yes, it's scary. Yes, uh, it can be overwhelming. But with you, we can walk confident knowing that you've conquered everything. Uh, we ask you to be with everyone who's been affected Grant them uh, rest, grant them healing, uh, give us encouragement, and continue to be with all of our leaders and guide and lead them. We ask all this in Jesus' name. It's in his name that we join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In Numbers chapter 6, God instructed Aaron the high priest that as people left the temple, that he would raise his hand and bless them with the Lord's name, so they knew the Lord was going with them. We're going to end our service the same way, so you know the Lord is going with you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We close our service today with the song, Renew Me, O Eternal Light. The Lord bless your week.